Hello, everybody. This is Carrie with Unicorn Company. New computer, new setup. I hope that this all comes through well, and I'll find out in post. Anyway, um, lately we've been seeing a lot of things happening in the competitive Battletech world, which we haven't seen in a long time. And I want to go into what I'm seeing here, and then news about some Iron Man Metal release schedule stuff. Okay, so a couple of competitive events have come up recently, the first of which is the Atlantic City Open, which is hosting a, battle, a normal Battletech event on June 11th and 12th. This is definitely an event that I will be missing um, because I know that I'm either going to be working that weekend or I'm going to be at a Pride event. So, not making that. Uh, the other tournament that is coming up on the East Coast is the Nova Open, which will be hosting a two-day Battletech Alpha Strike event. Um, this is being run by uh, the person who runs Death Ray Designs, if I recall correctly. Um, and it looks like it's going to be a 250-point event, and it runs for two days. Finally, before I stop talking about the upcoming tournaments and conventions on the East Coast, I will be attending RavenCon this year. That is certain. I will likely have a 350-point Alpha Strike list with me, and if you want to play, bring a full 350. I don't intend or plan on playing the 350-200 format unless I'm at an event that actually requires it. Um, I'll be there to play games hang out in some awesome places, and of course sit down and chat if anyone wants to just talk about the game we love or the awesome universe it is set in. Anyway, enough of that. Let's get into the release schedule coming up for Ironwind Medals for the spring and summer quarters of 2022. Ironwind announced their release schedule recently for the next two quarters, and I'm a bit excited to see this. First of all, in the spring releases, we'll have the Carrion Crow Lightning LHN C5, awesome that builds the 8R or the 8T, and a Ryokin kit that builds the TC or the B. So that would be the um, Creative Juggernaut release. Then in the summer, we will be getting the Stormwolf Prime Battlemaster, which builds the 1G or the 1GB, Regent Prime, and Black Knight BLK-9KNT, which I can't remember if that's a Clan Buster or not, but I'm sure if it isn't, we will be seeing that on its way at some point. Um, then also we have a few web, web releases coming out this year from them, uh, so you can only get these on their website and not at retail locations, although I'm sure some retail places will probably buy them and sell them anyway, um, because there are cool places that do that. But anyway, um, some are probably out already, if I, if I recall what I last saw on their website. Uh, the releases for the web-only stuff includes the Saxon A. PC with the standard laser, laser, not lazier, and headquarter variants, a Shadow Cat 3 arm sprue, um, I guess it's a variant, didn't say, the Cyrano gunship, uh, prime mover, uh, two pack of wheeled scouts, the Sojourner B, a Wolverine that builds the 7M or the 7M2, or the 7K, the Defender Warship standard version, and finally the Carrion Crow A. I'm excited to see that Ironwind is releasing more of the plastic minis as metal, capable of building multiple variants with one kit, and you know it gives you quite a bit of custom customizability. Um, I might have just invented a word there. Anyway, as well as an extensive amount of bits um, that'll let you modify things in the future. Uh, the biggest complaint I have seen that as far as the plastic minis is that they're pre-posed and pre-built and in order to even pose them in a different way there's cutting and gluing involved and i think that the metal minis even with the plastic out there provide an awesome alternative when you're looking to have different variants or even just have a mini in a slightly different pose that way they all look the same now let's dive into our main subject um today i'm going to steer things in a slightly different direction we're going to take a look at different eras from the rest of the season forward, which is awesome and not so awesome. You know, what is awesome and not so awesome about them, how they tie into the machines you might see from Alpha Strike and that era, and our mech tech will be tied directly to the subject of that era on every episode um, while we cover those. So in this episode, we're going to talk, going to start off with Succession Wars. In, particularly, in particular, the fourth Succession War, which is where a lot of the old guard had their introduction to the game, and of course where some of them chose to stay as the timeline moved forward. 
the fourth war is where the game originally put us in the 1980s and had just passed into the clan invasion era when I got into the game. Regardless of this, I did find myself exploring the lore of the era and much of it, although sometimes dated, can hold up today. Uh, there were a few big of oh English, right? There were a few big events in this era or right before, such as the Merrick Civil War. I have no clue which one. I just know it is where the Dragoons were betrayed, which we'll see a lot. Uh, the Davi and Steiner wedding that set the Federated Sons and Lyran Commonwealth on their eventual paths to a bloody and fl bloody fratricidal war. And having mentioned them already, introduces us to the Wolf's Dragoons as a truly major uh, player in the mercenary business. I am sort of lumping the Fourth War and the War 3039 together here as, well, one seems to have just been a continuation of the other, and the War 39 also sets up the future of Comstar and their ability to face down the clans. If we look at the setting coming in, House Davian is heavily portrayed as the White Hats of the Universe. Um, the Federated Sons is set up to be a major power and good guy as it seems to be written mostly from a very Western-centric point of view in the early novels. The Laren Commonwealth is essentially their good German buddy who seems to have more money than brains. The Free Worlds League is just confused. Badly confused. The Draconis Combine is one of the two big bads, but it is primarily the big bad, seeing as how the Capella Confederation is essentially a doormat for uh, House Davian in the Fourth War. So, I've touched a little on the significant events of the era, and I want to be a bit more in-depth now. Now. Ah, I can't talk today. Anyway, so, first, before I, before I do that, I don't have the note in here, but I wanted to say that you're not going to hear anything really about the Confederation. Um, I think I've mentioned it a few times, but the problem with the Capellan Confederation is it really wasn't fleshed out at all in this era. The, the other factions were pretty well fleshed out. The Capellan Confederation was essentially space China and uh, with, with some space Russia thrown in for good measure. I don't know how else to say that. So, first of all, we have two major events right before the Fourth Succession War. Both involve the Dragoons. The Merrick Civil War and the betrayal of the Dragoons, see, it came up again, uh, by the Draconis Combine. So, the Merrick Civil War is what sets up Natasha Kerensky to be a badass of unparalleled proportions, rivaled only by the Bounty Hunter. This was also a tragic event because it involved the death of Jamie Wolf's brother, and in a way helped establish a value of family among the Dragoons. The next big event involving them was the Draconis Combine's attempt to integrate the Dragoons into their state through a strategy called the Company Store. Now, before I dive into what happened, I want to touch on the concept of the Company Store, which is actually longer than what happened. Uh, the Company Store is something that doesn't get seen in the universe very often anymore, and with the old clan era being more mercenary-focused, we might see it more often again. The way the company store concept works is when you have a mercenary employed by you, you make them dependent on you for their spare parts, their support, and drain their coffers until they're so dependent on you that they end up integrated into your military. The Draconis Combine attempted to do this themselves with the Dragoons, starting off with just company store level stuff, but finding that the Dragoons seem to be able to maintain their independence from them in material and financial needs. When this didn't work, they actually turned to attempting to frame the Dragoons for destroying a town, you know, just because. And when they did this, they ended up causing them to leave for the Federated Sons and decided if they couldn't have Wolf's Dragoons for themselves, they would destroy them. This was attempted on the World of Misery in a battle that nearly shattered the Dragoons and mauled the DCM for DCMS forces sent after them. And at that point, I believe they entered the employment of the Fed Sons. So the next big event is the Davi and Steiner wedding. Now, I'm not going to get into the oddness of the marriage, though. The wedding itself was held on Terra and hosted by Comstar, where Hans gave his new bride the Capellan Confederation. I think his exact words were, I give you the Capellan Confederation. 
So as the wedding's happening, the, the armed forces of the Federated Sons leap into action and strike into the Capellan Confederation. Um, Max Leo, the chancellor of the Capellan State, realized that each dinner plate he, that was in the, um, at the, the event had one of his worlds listed on them. And these were the worlds that were getting struck. And he essentially tried to get all as many plates as he could so he could know what, you know, what was happening to his state. Uh, but it did end up leaving the Capellan Confederation as a small rump state where they lost about half their territory. Not only did this happen, but the, Fed, the uh, St. Ives region of the Capellan Confederation broke away and became the St. Ives Compact and a close ally to the Federated Sons, at least until the Civil War era. But that's two eras away. So once this offensive ran out of steam, the Federated Sons and Lear Commonwealth began joint maneuvers near the Combine border. Because, you know, after you just beat the snot out of one of your neighbors, why not just flash your military around like nothing else? And it's about been 10 years, 12 years, something like that. Actually, no, 3025. Yeah, so I, I can't remember exactly. I'm, I'm not mathing right now. Anyway, so they start doing some joint maneuvers, uh, which leads into Operation Rat and the War of 3039. So the offensive itself is covered in Air to the Dragon pretty well and was a thrust into the Combine, which was actually countered through clandestine efforts of Comstar, where they supplied the Combine with mostly downgraded equipment. Apparently, um, it was Star League, Star League equipment, crabs, katanas, um, well, crockets, uh, stuff like that. But they apparently forgot to strip some of the double heat sinks out of them or stuff like that. And I think I've said stuff like that a few times now. Anyway. So they tried to strip most of the equipment out that was advanced and replace it with standard versions. They didn't succeed in all of them, and the Combine got some technology, which would be much needed in the coming years. Um, in exchange for this, the you know Comstar, the benevolent telecommunications company that everybody loved in the inner sphere, um, they got Anastasius Foked. Or at least the man who would be known as Anastasius Foked. <sighs> so much of what happened in the War 39 and um, you know what it set up gave us the setup for the clan invasion. So it gave the clans a nice little slice of the pie to invade through that had a much weaker military and economy. Um, thanks to Theodore and Comstar pushing for the creation of the Free Rastalag Republic. It started to get some high technology out there to the Draconis Combine. Um, you know, it, it was essentially 39 set up after, 20, after, after the Fourth War in 25, what was going to be coming in the 50s, in about 10 years after that. So, you know, that's sort of what we have to look at is a lot of people say well nothing happens it shows something else but yes there are things in Battletech that give us lead-ins to other things a lot of people just don't pay attention to it anyway um let's look at how you know what it's like to play alpha strike in this era or at least just use units from the era so mechs and vehicles from the air don't have advanced equipment like double heat sinks, extra light engines, stuff like that. So what this usually translates to is having units with an overheat value as a standard thing, having very high structure values and generally lower damage values than their mod more modern counterparts. They also will probably have lower armor. So in all honesty, this is just a fact of the era, and we see this in Battletech as much as we see it in the real world, where... For example, generations of fighter planes have been getting better and better as time has gone on. You know, as awesome as a P-51 Mustang is, it does not hold a candle to something like a Super Hornet, which is actually a reasonably old platform. So, Alpha Strike, much like Battletech games in this era, can take a while because the mechs can take a great deal of punishment in the heavy and assault classes <sighs> um, in comparison to the damage output. One of the perks of units 
in this era, though, are they can take a lot of punishment. This means if you want to play a game that is more based around attrition as opposed to raw firepower, the mechs from this era will allow you to play this type of game. Some of the assault mechs in this era are awesome units to keep in the backfield to hold an objective. Just be prepared to lose them um, pretty easily if they're ganged up on because they're not going to have the speed to get away or a high TMM. And they're going to take a lot of criticals. You're actually probably more likely to get critical to death than you are to uh, have the mech actually blown out from under you. So let's look at one of these venerable machines in today's mech tech segment. This mech tech segment is brought to you by Miftkitty Minis, producers of high quality resin miniatures, and you can find them at miftkittyminis.bigcartel.com. So today we look at the ride of many a famous mech warrior, the Warhammer. The... We're going to start off with the Warhammer 6R, as this is a variant that many people started off with in the Succession Wars era, and we'll cover its variants from the Star League and a few select later variants as well. The Warhammer itself is a simple concept and a simple machine. In many ways, it is a lot like the Marauder, in that it comes to the battlefield with a pair of PPCs and some backup weapons. Where the Marauder is more based on purely mech combat, the Warhammer has a toolbox of weapons that allows it to work in a variety of roles, at least in the earlier models. The Warhammer 6R is a 70-ton mech built around a Vox 280 Fusion engine, giving it a top speed of almost 65 kilometers an hour. It has a somewhat light amount of armor protection with 10 tons of armor, but is cooled by 18 double heat or sorry, 18 single heat sinks. So he's saying double heat sinks. I almost slipped that up. Well, I did kind of. Anyway, its arms are dominated by particle projection cannons in each one. Uh, well, a particle projection cannon in each one. With a medium laser and small laser in each side torso. And an SRM-6 launcher with one ton of ammunition in the right torso. Finally, for anti-infantry work, the mech has a machine gun in each side torso with a single ton of ammunition housed in the center torso. For the era and the game itself it was designed for, this is a good design. The concept is solid with the ability to fire the mech's PPCs almost continuously. And it can keep punishing an enemy. And, you know, if they get to short range with the, missile, the short range missiles and the lasers. The variants from this era are the 6D which actually removes the SRM-6 launcher and machine guns, adds two heat sinks and a little bit of armor. The 6K, which removes their machine guns and ammunition in favor of just two heat sinks. Um, and the 6L modification by House Leo, Leo, the Capellan Confederation, that removes the machine guns in favor of flamers. Because, you know, machine guns just aren't a brutal enough way to eliminate infantry as it stands. Normally, I would give you more on each of these, but they're very much slight variations on a theme in this case, and are quite minor modifications as opposed to what we see later on. The battle values respectively for them are with the 6R model, 1299. The 6D model has a battle value of 1471. The 6K has a battle value of 1305, and the 6L has a battle value of 1311. So, the first non-Succession Wars variant I want to touch on is the Warhammer WHM-6RB, or the Royal Warhammer. Well, the first of two. The Warhammer 6RB was a pretty straightforward variant of the machine. It replaced the 18 single heat sinks with 17 double heat sinks, making it substantially cooler than its standard version, and had an Artemis IV fire control system linked to the SRM launcher. Finally, to make it a bit better in actually surviving a conflict, the armor was upgraded to ferrofibrous armor, which gives it a small amount of increased armor protection. This variant has a battle value of 1431. The other royal variant is the 7A. The 7A takes the Warhammer to the extreme end of what Star League technology could do without sacrificing survivability for an extra light engine. 
The 7A is built on an endosteel chassis and cooled by 16 double heat sinks this time. The PPCs have been replaced with a pair of extended range particle projection cannons, and the SRM-6 retains the Artemis IV fire control system. The, oh, I worded that weird, didn't I? Uh, at least in the script. Finally, to make it a bit better at actually surviving a conflict, the armor, oh, hold up, I am reading. Well, yeah. Okay, so let's go back to the 7A. Um, let's see, your PPCs, SRM-6 retains the Artemis IV fire control system, the 6RB. It replaces its machine guns and small lasers with a pair of small pulse lasers, which are actually quite effective in that role, and adds two more medium lasers to the center torso. The battle value of this then cutting edge machine is 1679. So if you compare the 7A to the 6R, you know, it, it's quite frankly, a large leap in capability, um, at least in battle tech. So I want to look at the other two variants as well, uh, two other variants as well. The first of these is the Warhammer 9D, which is House Davian's eventual full evolution of the 6D. This mech is built on an endosteel chassis and powered by an extra light engine to make it 20 kilometers an hour faster than its predecessor. It is protected by 13 and a half tons of ferrofibrous armor, it has a lighter armament of two, PP, two ER PPCs and three ER medium lasers. Now, these are all linked to a targeting computer, making up in accuracy what it lacks in firepower. Finally, as a small surprise, it can jump up to 90 meters with three torso mounted jump jets. Um, I have to say from personal experience, that this is an awesome thing. So, most people don't think about it. You know, it's three jump jets. It's not a lot of jump capability. <sighs> you know, it, on at least on a battle tech map, it, it is a small amount of jumping. Give me a second. I had to get some water. Um, anyway, it's <sighs> 90 meters is not a lot. Three hexes or six inches in Alpha Strike. Now, in Alpha Strike, it plays a little different because it doesn't doesn't make the distinction between torso and leg-mounted jump jets. But in classic paddle tech, you can walk this into a river on one turn. And a lot of times your opponents will realize, oh, well, they're sort of stuck. Not so much, because now you can leap out of the water. Um, and a lot of times they'll close with you because they think they can, like, get a kick or something like that. Cool beans. Now I hop out of the water and my buddies are on the other side of the water and you have a choice to make. Do you face the Warhammer or do you face whoever the hell is on the other side of that river? Because regardless of what you do, you're going to have somebody shooting at your back. But yeah. So back to the actual script. The battle value of the Davian Super Warhammer, as I like to call it, is 2152. And the final variant we're going to look at is one of the clan refits. The Warhammer C3. This Warhammer, at least as far as without getting into the two Cs, is the most pure successor to the last Royal Warhammer variant. Built entirely from clan technology, the C3 model has a clan extra light engine, which allows it to carry a heavy weapons and equipment payload. Each arm mounts an ER PPC, and each side torso has an ER medium laser with a medium pulse laser. These are all linked to an advanced targeting computer. If that's not scary enough, the side torsos also each have a streak SRM6 launcher with one ton of ammunition. Um, and they're both protected by case. In case infantry do decide that they want to play with it, it has an anti-infantry explosive pod on its right leg. Um, so if somebody decides they're going to try to stick a satchel charge on this thing, it will essentially hand grenade them. It is cooled by 17 double heat sinks. The battle value of the Warhammer C3 is 2772. Um, okay, so before I get into the Alpha Strike stats, this thing 
it's pretty scary when you think about it. It, it clan ERPPCs can rip the head off of an enemy mech or just a mech in general, and you have two of them linked to a targeting computer. And then it also has, mind you, the clan medium pulse laser may be a short range weapon by clan standards. By inner sphere standards, it's not. And you have one of those with a targeting computer linked to it. So that's a minus three for that thing to shoot. Also, the SRM launchers, you can try to shoot every single time you have a target because they don't fire unless they obtain a lock, which means that ton of ammunition is going to run you way longer than it would on a standard SRM launcher if you were sitting there flinging missiles at everything that walked past your crosshairs. So, yeah, I mean, in, in classic Battletech, oh, 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 that's, that's, that's some scary stuff. Um, so let me take, and we'll take you on a little adventure of what these are like in Alpha Strike. So the Warhammer 6R, or the original, as it were, is a battle mech. It's size 3, target movement modifier of 1, movement of 8, has a short and medium value of 3, and a long of 2, with an overheat value of 0. Uh, the mech has an armor value of 5 and structure of 6, and it has no special abilities. It comes in at 32 points. And this is what I was talking about originally, but I'm going to get into it in a minute here because I have a few to go through real quick. And then we'll start to get into the more advanced models. The 6D variant of the Warhammer is almost identical to the 6R. Uh, it shares the same type, movement modifier, movement. Um, it has a short and medium range of 3 and a long of 2 with an overheat of 0. So, yeah. It has 7 points of armor and 6 points of structure with the special ability of energy, making it immune to ammo explosions. Now, this one has a point value of 36. The 6K is literally identical in every way to the 6R, so it needs no real description. And the 6L has the same type, size, target movement modifier, and movement stats of the 6R with damage values of 3 short, 2 medium, and 2 long, and an overheat value of 2 with no special abilities. So, all of the variants of the Warhammer are roughly equal, equal with the exception of the 6D, which is an early flash bulb. It's capable of taking a bit more damage. Um, in a modern sense, the 6D makes for a reasonably well-priced bullet sponge to hold an objective. Um, but yeah, this is like this is what I was talking about with the 3025 Max. Mm, excuse me. The Warhammer is a highly respected heavy mech. It is something that you don't mess with in Battletech. In the 3025 era, yeah, it... It can hurt you, like, really good. It, it's really good at hurting you. It's its job. Um, I mean, it's all of their jobs, but still. The, the Warhammer, the 6R, and the 6D, primarily. I mean, I, pref I prefer the 6D over the 6R simply because it doesn't go boom. But they, you know, these things in Alpha Strike, they, they just don't have the the damage output. And when you started to when you start to get into like the Atlas, the Banshee, you know these big 95, 100 tonners that you'll see every now and then in the in the the 3025 context, the the fourth succession war type context, the the damage output versus the armor and structure that they have is way, way different than what you'll get into in the modern era, where you've got mechs pushing 6, 7 um, attack value at short and medium on some of them, and armor structures of like 8, 3, 8, 4, stuff like that. So the mechs from that era just don't have the kick that more modern equipment does. So, next up on our, our list of Warhammers were the two Royals. Uh, the 6RB, once again, type battle mech size 3, target movement 1, movement of 8. It's a brawler and has a um, 
short range value of 5, medium 4, and a long of 2. It has no overheat and armor and structure each of 6. No special abilities. Comes in at 38 points. So, like I said, in, in Battletech, it's, it's quite an improvement over the standard Warhammer. In Alpha Strike, eh, it's not a lot. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit better. It's superior technically, but it's not hands down. Oh my goodness, this thing is way better than the Warhammer. Now, the 7-8, the last of the Royal Warhammers, is definitely a stronger machine. It's type battle mech size three, target movement one. It's a brawler again. Has a short and medium value of four and a long of two. So we're starting to see a little bit of creep in the capabilities. Mind you, it has less less close range value than the six RB, but it's a bit more consistent. Um, no overheat and Armor is on par with the 60. It's at 7 armor and 6 structure. But it does have the special ability of case. So if you do happen to, let's say, hit the ammo, it doesn't just die. Uh, the point value of the 7-8 is 40 points even. For what Star League technology was capable of, I mean, this is not a bad design. I do like it, and, you know... It's it's good. It's not amazing. It's not great, but it's good. Especially when we start to get into the newer stuff. But even there, you'll notice there's not much that can be done with the armor and structure. The older machines are going to be better. Because uh, we have the Warhammer 9D next. This is the evolution of the 60. Uh, type battle mech, size 3. Target move modifier of 2. Its movement is 10 slash 6 jump. And it's a sniper. Has damage values of 4 at short and medium and long at, at 2 at long. Um, has an overheat value of 0 and armor protection of 7 with structure of 3 because of the XL engine. It has the special abilities of ENE, jump week 1. It has a point value of 43 points. <sighs> so before we get into the clan refit the C3. Yeah, the, the 9D is an evolutionary machine. I'm not going to argue that. But it's also, at least in Alpha Strike, it's not superior. I mean, against the 9D, I would take a 7A any day of the week. Or even the 6D. Um, mind you, the 6D just doesn't have the same damage output. 332 as opposed to the 9D with its uh, 442. <clears throat> but with the lower structure value, you're going to eat through the structure value pretty quickly and get into that internal. And that's where the 60 some you know sometimes the older machines are actually superior then finally we have the warhammer c3 this as mentioned earlier feels like the next evolutionary step before you get into the warhammer 2c the c3 is tight battle mech size 3 movement of 8 it's a brawler has damage value of 6 at short six at medium and four at long has an overheat value of three and is protected with seven armor and four structure the c3 variant has the case and ecm special abilities with a point value of 49. okay so this mech um because next episode we're going to be talking about the warhammer 2c which and we're also going to be talking about the claim invasion spoilers anyway um this mech is I don't know how to put it. It is, in Alpha Strike at least, it's just as capable as the Warhammer 2C. It's a good machine. It's a solid machine. And unlike the 9D, where the 9D has 
minorly more damage output than like a 6R. This, or, or even a 6D. This thing hits like a brick at short and medium range. And at long range, you know... I mean, literally, in theory, one of these could strip the armor off of a 6D, I believe it is. Oh, almost. It could almost strip the armor off of a 6D in one shot. This is where, and, and clan technology is where you see, like, the big jump in damage values. I mean, we'll see that in the next episode when I cover the Warhammer 2C. But... Yeah, this is this is where you see that big jump. This is and honestly, this thing is in the the wheelhouse of the Warhammer 2C, which is its own fun little discussion that we'll get to next you know next episode. So, before I get into all the self-advertising as it were with the Patreon and all that, I do want to go ahead and one last thing I want to talk about after our mech tech segment, which I know usually closes the show. Um, I did want to go ahead, touch on the fact that we do have the raffle going on for the clan Nova cat G galaxy combined arms unit. There's also four prize packs, which include two force packs and a pair of dice, either by Aries games and miniatures or by death ray designs. Um, I do cover those in a video on the Unicorn Company YouTube channel. Um, but, you know, this is going to be a lot of miniatures. And it's I have some really awesome artists working on it. We've had some of the stuff come in. I've been sharing it on the Facebook groups out there. I'm sure that you all have seen it. Um, if you do want to go ahead and get a chance to win either one of the prize packs or the 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 unit itself um go ahead and go to the trevor project website which is www.thetrevorproject.org um, make a donation of at least five dollars and then forward your um, email from them your confirmation email with the receipt to trevorbtraffle at gmail.com. Um, each $5 that you donate gets you an entry into the raffle. There's no limit on how many entries you can have, although, obviously, um, they're $5 a pop. So, but yes, so go ahead, go donate, and get a chance to win an awesome unit or an awesome prize pack. And we are adding prizes all the time to this. So, you know, this is actually a pretty big raffle as far as like, you know, what you get for just a $5 entry if you win. Um, also, of course, you know, being the end of the podcast, I do want to go ahead and mention if you want to help support us and help us to, you know, Help us be able to go to more events, stuff like that. Um, uh, Patreon.com slash Unicorn Company. I have tiers from, I think I have a dollar tier, actually, which, yeah. All the way up to, oh, shoot, what's my biggest tier? I can't remember now. That's not good. <laughs> I have, like, four or five tiers. Anyway, I mean, I'm sure there's something in there, even if you just want to give, like, a dollar a month to help and every little dollar helps. I do appreciate all my patrons who already do help out with the podcast. And, you know, I just wanted to let you know that all of you are appreciated. Also, to my artists out there on the Trevor Project uh, company. Well, it's not a company anymore. It's a cluster. Um, anyway, to all the artists out there working on it, thank you so much. I really appreciate what you're doing. And everything that I've gotten so far from you has been awesome and wonderful. Um until next time, this is Carrie signing off. <laughs>